She's the first ever female in her role and therefore has had to overcome many barriers to get this far with an, a male-dominated office, office. Her past roles include being ambassador to Thailand and serving in the Bangladesh permanent mission to the UN in New York. She has been a strong advocate in many issues, including the Rohingya crisis, climate change, and being one of the first Bangladesh High, Commission, High Commissioners. One of her primary focuses is female empowerment within the South Asian community. Please give a warm welcome to Sinem, Sinem Minister Sneem. Good evening, everyone. It's um, so good to be here at Cambridge Union, my first time in my life, and to see so many brilliant people. You know, the future of the world, not only UK, but of the world, all the brilliant minds, the disruptive minds of Cambridge, and the students, particularly from South Asia, Bangladesh, I don't know if there are other countries, but uh, I see most of the faces of South Asians, so I presume they're either from Bangladesh or from other South Asian countries. Um, I would like to begin by paying, well, you know, Nasser, uh, let me just congratulate and thank Nasser for inviting me here, who's the president of the Bangla Society at the University of Cambridge. And, um, you know, he asked me to speak on uh, women empowerment uh, and, um, uh, you know, some perspectives from whether sociocultural practices influence women empowerment or religious values influence women empowerment. Not a debate, but exactly how Bangladesh progresses with women empowerment, an analysis of that. So I'd like to begin by paying a tribute to Emily Davis, who established the Girton College. It was the first women's college at the University of Cambridge, and probably the first in Britain to create the opportunity for women to stay in dormitories for higher education. At the same time, it was the University of Cambridge that took, it took them, you know, the United Kingdom many years until the late 40s to allow women to have the, a degree from Cambridge University. So it's great to be here at the Cambridge University. And um, you know who was the first, I mean, I'd like to pay a tribute to the first honorary graduate from women to graduate from Cambridge University, the Queen Mother. Um, who received an honorary degree in 1948. So it was more than 70 years that women at Cambridge had raised their voice to obtain a degree from this university uh, because there was a discriminatory practice. So again, it is a socio-cultural influence. Um, I'd also like to you know, pay a tribute to Dr. Jane Tillia, Tillia appointed the first woman lay chaplain at the Jesus College in 1984, who wore the badge, behaved badly. Under, the, under her clerical robes, gifted to her by her friend Lisa Jardine, who was also another woman, a historian, who had graduated here from Cambridge from the Newnham College. I'd like to pay a tribute to Dorothy Hodgkin, the first Nobel laureate chemistry, uh, Nobel laureate from Cambridge, and of late, Chantal Bell, who is Forbes' third most influential woman in tech, who invented women's cervical cancer kit at home. So all these brilliant women who've walked the, I don't know, halls in Cambridge of the library, who are celebrated, who are brilliant minds, and who had made disruptive you know, thoughts, thinkers, academicians, scientists all over the world. With these, I would like to focus, actually, what does history tell us? Did religion influence women's empowerment or the discriminatory practices? Or were, this, were there more influences of patriarchy, the, the patriarchal, ancient patriarchal militarism, the sexism, the misogyny, the, uh, you know, how women were perceived in power structures by men and society? If you look at ancient women monarchs, and you know, st let's start with 1500 BC, when we had the first woman pharaoh that ruled Egypt, uh, Hatshepsut. She was the first influential woman pharaoh, and of course we have Cleopatra afterwards. But, um, and then we have so many, you know, um, Queen Elizabeth I, but before that, you know, Emperor Wu of China, the only woman who have ever ruled China. And then after Queen Elizabeth War, in, in, you know, in, in South Asia, we have Sultana Razia, the only woman that sat at the Sultanate in the seat of Delhi um, throughout history. 
And then we've had, of course, Queen Victoria, and we've had influential sultanas in the Ottoman Empire, such as Hurem Sultan, and many other. But at the end of the day, while these women, you know, um, there was also about something about uh, you know, inheritance, but at the same time, did these women rulers, or could they change the fate of common women? Could they legislate something to do away with the discrimination? The answer is no, they actually did not. Women's rights and the, you know, the, the voice of women was raised not until, just like in Cambridge, when they actually had access to a degree after finishing the, you know, in the late 1940s. Actually, you know, since the Industrial Revolution, when women started going to work and earning their wages, they started their rights. And we had in the early 20th centuries the fight for franchise and equal rights to vote. So therefore, and that did not come from the top, it actually came from the bottom. It came from common women who are working in industry, who are perhaps students, activists. So um, if you look at the sociocultural practices, um, particularly, you know, the pre-Islam time in MENA region or South Asia, you would see that it's profound sociocultural uh, practices, uh, patriarchal hierarchies and power structures that dominated the discriminatory practices against women rather than religion. In fact, when Islam came, uh, post-Islam, there were specific rights given to women for the first time. Before that, in none of the religions, there were any defined, well-defined rights for women. Um, for example, ancient South Asia. Uh, we did have, you know, in ancient South Asia, um, women were worshipped, there were women goddesses and still are. So women were the symbol of power. And yet, when it came to ruling the country or, you know, having a voice in the court, that was missing. Similarly, you know, um, I would look at Bangladesh, but before I do that, I, I created this context to say that Bengal, which has, which has always been part of ancient Indian civilization, um, you know, have always had a profound secular influence. In Bengal as well, you know, we've had the influences of sociocultural practices of um, ancient, uh, you know, Hinduism, uh, the Bengali practices, and then, you know, the profound influences of the Buddhist dynasty and the Hindu civilizations until the 12th century, uh, where women were allowed to work, they were wage laborers, they were actually dancers in temples, but at the same time, they were allowed to pay limited role in the court. So there were certain rights. However, uh, you know, uh, they didn't have rights to inherit anything under any of the personal laws. And they didn't have a right to, um, you know, um, uh, when it comes to um, uh, inheriting property, either from husband or father, they didn't have that right. So they didn't have this economic rights, and of course, not in political rights. Um, later on, definitely, you know, when the independent sultans came to Bengal, and followed by Mughals, uh, women were subject to Islamic laws gradually. And according to those laws, of course, they had these rights uh, to inherit property from husband and from father, and, uh, you know, well-defined roles within the Sharia, the Muslim law. But at the same time, you know, many of the uh, Mughal emperors and, em you know, their, 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 their empresses or their sultanas did have a handsome amount of allowances that was allowed to them, and they did make certain degree, including uh, Nur Jahan, which, uh, you know, there were many court orders that she had signed on behalf of her husband, Emperor Jahangir. So those kind of, you know, um, personal stories are there, but in general, uh, if I say that Bengal, um, after the British had landed in India, which was again in Bengal, which is their first post, uh, immediately, you know, before that, the Bengali, uh, it was even within British Empire, it was the Bengali intellectuals that took to British education, culture. But interestingly, in Bangladesh, uh, the pioneer and the champion and the forebearer of women's education and empowerment and liberty and freedom was a Bengali Muslim woman who had established an all-women uh, school for Muslim Bengalis. Her name is Begum Rukia Sakawat Hussein, and she set up the Sakawat Memorial in Calcutta in 1911, as early as that. In fact, that was the first all-women residential 
women educational institution in entire India at that time. And it was none other than a Bengali Muslim women. And why? Again, it's social cultural practices, you know, support from a husband, support from a family. So they were a progressive family. These are the progressive values that have always influenced Bengal. And after that, you know, Taki University was set up in 1920. Same time, around the same time when the University of London was established. And in Taki University, women could actually get a degree right after it was opened in 1920. So Taki University would be celebrating 100 years. And women had the access to education and a master's degree and an undergraduate degree in Taki University for 100 years. Um, and, uh, you know, when uh, Bangladesh was left to, I mean, if you look at the British time, the early sort of 18th and 20, 19th and 20th century, it was the Bengali reformers like Raja Ram Mohan Roy and Isha Chandra Bidashagar who had done away with extremely harmful practices against women. To begin with, you know, uh, women used to be burned after the husband died. It's called emulsion of sati or the virgin. And, um, you know, that was done away by Raja Ram Mohan Roy, the social reformist, and it, which is a Bengali. And then again, Isha Chandra, he had done away, he had worked worked with Lord Benting, the, that, that time Viceroy of India, to do away with the practice that, you know, widows cannot remarry. So remarriage of widows. That was also done by a Bengali reformist and educationist, such as Ishwar Chandra. And these influences continued with Begum Rokhe Sakhawat Hussein's leadership of educating more Bengali women. And that gradually moved on to Dhaka University, and Dhaka University in the 40s and 50s had graduates uh, in public administration and political science and sociology and Eden College. These are all there in Bangladesh. The entire structure of educating women and giving them rights and freedom were there. Therefore, you know, when in 1947, the British left Bangladesh with the Islamic Republic of um, Pakistan, the first Islamic Republic, uh, Bangladesh, uh, you know, there was a clear cultural clash between Bangladesh, the women in Bangladesh, uh, you know, students in Bangladesh. There were, uh, and in every movement uh, against this, well, we were not, you know, this is very strange. So the British had left, there was post empire, again, recolonization of Bangladesh, and where we were being discriminated as Bengalis between 47 and 1971. And in, during that period, in every political, social, and cultural movement, women and students, women, educated women, were always in the, on the field, in the protest, in the marches, right next to men. So in 1952 language movement, Bengali women were on the streets of Dhaka, right next to Bengali male students. In 1971, in 66, they were on the, on, the, on the streets protesting to ask for self-determination for political rights. In 1970, they were participating in political parties. So our father of the nation, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, had always had women in his, in his party cabinet. And women like Ivy Rahman and his own daughter, Sheikh Hasina, were very much part of the party. And they were actually protesting to, so that Pakistan hands over power because it's the Bangladeshi um, East Pakistan party called Awami League that won the elections in 1970, the majority seats. But, you know, power wasn't handed over and eventually Pakistani army was sent to Bangladesh. So in 1971 war, again, women got trained side by side with the combats, which we call the freedom fighters. So there were, you know, thousands of women freedom fighters who were educated women who went around the country. There were cultural activists who were women who sang and danced and inspired the liberation freedom fighters. But at the same time, there were more than 300,000 women who, again, you know, uh, you can call them victims of rape and sexual slavery for nine months, while the Pakistan army had, you know, uh, deliberately they used as a tool of war, you know, used sexual violence uh, during conflict as a tool in war. And all those women uh, were given in 1971, December, when the father of the nation came back uh, from the Pakistan prison to Bangladesh. He gave them the title, The War Heroes. It's called Biranganas. There's a movie called Rising Silence. Uh, it's just been released, and it is about, not about these women who were raped, who are violated. They identify themselves as victims. They actually come back with a vengeance to survive, the spirit for their survival. So, you know, they're the ones who 
um, actually got rejected when Bangabandhu was assassinated in 1975. Before that, he rehabilitated them and created a rehabilitation center for them. But when he was assassinated, after that, their rehabilitation center was closed, and they were actually rejected in the society. But they moved on, they lived on, and they said that this is life, and we have to survive, and we will put our heads high and walk straight. The movie is about that. And there are heroes, and in 2015, Bangabandhu's daughter, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, has termed them as freedom fighters and allowed them freedom fighter allowances. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's a national sort of scar that never goes away, but at the same time, we consider them to be our war heroes. And um, this is how Bengali nationalism and Bengali sociocultural influences have defined how women behave in Bangladesh and how they feel about their own empowerment of the power within. Um, and of course, you know, right now, today, with these, with these influences, Bangladesh today, uh, you know, um, uh, is, according to the World Economic Forum, uh, we are in the 47th position amongst more than 150 countries in the world when it comes to political empowerment women. We're in the fifth position right after Rwanda. You know, we are actually competing with countries such as Norway, Iceland, who have a per capita income of 65,000 US dollars, and we have under 2,000. But when it comes to political access and political empowerment of women, we're in the fifth position. And our overall index in the gender parity index, we are 47th. Uh, we're holding the 47th rank last year, and the first in Asia. Therefore, in terms of access of women to politics in our parliament, we are, are um, the members of parliament in Bangladesh, our average is 23.7%. As you know, the world average of women heads of government and women in parliament is, you know, heads of government is less than 20%, it's about 18 to 19%. So we have about 18 to 19% women heads of state and heads of government around the world, and Bangladesh is in that 18%. But at the same time, you know, our parliamentarians, women parliamentarians, we have 75 now. It's 23.7 percent. That's the global average. So, you know, our, our rank in political empowerment is, in, again, if you go to local government, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has reserved 30 percent of the seats in every sphere of local government for women. So you have to be elected, but your seats are guaranteed. So therefore, women are automatically getting into the local government and governing, being part of the policy making, and the voices are heard there. Um, you know, uh, primary schools, 60% uh, of the uh, you know, primary school teachers' seats are reserved for women. Um, in the United Kingdom or any other country, it's unthinkable. But it's actually reserved. Only women can, have to be, you know, 60% of the primary school teachers have to be women. This is how um, she has designed the policy in a very clever manner, where people might think we are a Muslim-majority country, uh, nearly 86, 87% people are Muslim, but um, how come Bangladesh's index is so high? But this is why. It's the sociocultural thinking and influences of being a Bengali. And you know, in 1971, why is that Bangladesh emerged as a people's republic from the uh, Pakistani Islamic Republic? We were suffocating under those kinds of sociocultural practices that we're not used to. For example, you know, we wanted to speak in our language, uh, Tagore is a, has profound influence on Bangladesh. Lalon Shah has a profound influence in Bangladesh culture. And those are the things that we were not allowed to practice, our cultural practices. And of course, there are political and economic discrimination. Uh, so, you know, here is Bangladesh today in, the, in 2019, where our Women Empowerment Index is one of the top in the world. Uh, even though, you know, we are an LDC, we have just entered the graduation process, but when it comes to Human Development Index, when it comes to Women Empowerment Index, our index is very strong. We are proud of those credentials. Um, uh, I also want to mention that, you know, there's also perception that, you know, um, harmful practices such as uh, femicide, you know, killing of women by intimate partners, domestic violence, global problem. Quite often people think that, you know, it's, it's, the, it's something to do with Islamic societies, but that's not true. Actually, the highest incidence of femicide is in Latin America, and it has nothing to do with religion. The highest incidence of female genital mutilation, such harmful practices, are in the Horn of Africa. It has nothing to do with religion. These are patriarchal practices that has been there. Um, you know, the highest, you know, the, if you look at the wage differences, there's still huge wage differences between men and women, but not in Bangladesh. Everybody gets equal pay. 
In Bangladesh, we have about 42% of our women in formal labor force in the ready-made garment industry, and then in the agricultural sector, more than 25 million women, uh, 5 million women in garment sector, and everybody gets an equal pay. That's very important. And that is why, you know, in the World Economic Forum Gender Gap Index, the Gender Parity Index, while we have more girls in primary school and secondary school, the ratio is right now 57 is to 41. So we have nearly 56% women in primary and secondary school, and less numbers of boys. So women is surpassing boys in every way in school, um, you know, in, in army. Uh, you'd be happy to learn that, you know, Bangladesh is the largest contributor of women peacekeeping forces in UN peacekeeping. So we have given our, not only police, but we, you know, the, right now we have Bangladeshi women flying helicopters in UN peacekeeping uh, operations, and as well as in Lebanon, in the frigate, there are Bangladeshi Navy women officers who are serving in, um, and we have all women police unit serving in Haiti, in Congo, in other parts of peacekeeping. So, you know, um, we're very proud of our women armed forces. At the same time, you know, our women cricket team won the T20 Asia Cup. So our girls are winning cricket matches. They're actually going to Everest and winning the Everest. So they're Bangladeshi girls who went and, you know, um, conquered the Everest. So they're climbing. Um, you know, of course, uh, at the same time, uh, well, I'd like to take a little bit of pride in my Prime Minister, if you'd allow me. You know, our Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, she has received the Women 50, 50, Planet 5050 Award. That means the UN is still striving to have 5050. But you'll be surprised that, you know, the area of women empowerment is so less defined that the United Nations, even though it was created in 1945, didn't have a dedicated, specialized body for women. The UN Women, it took them more than 70 years to create it. So UN Women was created only in 2000. 2010. And uh, our Prime Minister received this award of Planet 5050 because in Bangladesh we've achieved 5050 in education and in other sectors. But uh, in employment we are about 42%, but UN is less than 42%, uh, you know, in filling 5050 posts for men and women. And she's also won the Agent of Change Award by the Global Partnership Forum. Now, there are Prime Ministers, um, like I said, you know, there are about 18% women heads of government, somebody like Angela Merkel, who's an institution. So, you know, if a woman being at the head of a country is actually making some substantive changes, she is the agent of change. She is subtly changing the policies. It's not easy to have 100% rights, 100% guarantee in any country, but it's even difficult in a Muslim-majority society. There are always, you know, the conservative groups and the right-wing groups or the, you know, uh, radicals who would not agree with you. So it's difficult, it's a big challenge, but she's doing it, and that's why she was given the Agent of Change Award. She's also received the Global Women Leadership Award in 2018 by the World Global Women's Summit. And uh, we've also received the Women in Parliament a global Forum Award because of our large number of parliamentarians. And of course, she is always within the top 30 or the top 12 in Forbes and Fortune magazine's most influential women. But more importantly, uh, she's the only, I know that Angela Merkel has given refuge to refugees from Syria, but for us, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina took the decision to give shelter to 1.1 million Rohingya refugees. Now that's a big take, and you have to have a big heart for that. When she was interviewed by Al Jazeera as to, you know, we saw you speaking to President Trump the other day, they, they met at the UN General Assembly, and didn't you ask for help from him, uh, you know, to look after the, to get support for the Rohingya refugees? Her answer was that, um, you know, President Trump policies to not give shelter to refugees. So I cannot do that. But however, we are not a rich country. We are, we are a, not that rich country, not a fluent country. But we do have space. If our people, 165 people, can have two, you know, two times meals, so will the Rohingyas, whether we get help or not. So that tells you about the kind of statesman that, that she's, you know, she's, she's risen to, uh, the statesmanship. Um, you know, with these words, I would like to um, say that, you know, uh, from South Asia, uh, Bangladesh, this is the age of the SDGs, and, you know, we have placed SDG 5, which is achieving gender equality in every sphere of our society, economics, politics, culture, uh, and as well as, um, you know, um, work, labor force, 
Um, so we're trying to do that. Um, but when it comes to uh, achieving the SDGs, there are challenges. Uh, in SDGs, you know, SDG 5, when it says gender equality and uh, empowering every girl and women, it does have about 18 um, targets, including you have to completely eliminate you know, domestic violence by 2030, you have to completely eliminate any kind of discriminatory um, you know, laws by 2030, many, many very steep targets, which just like climate change, this is also difficult to achieve because you know you can't change the society the society or the patriarchal the misogynist society it is it is transforming only in the last 100 years let's face it it you know we hope that by the next 100 years it will be all eliminated but uh, i if we don't take very drastic action and if there's not change of psychology uh, or this patriarchal thinking uh, structure i don't think that 2030 is a, it's, it's, it's a big ambitious target, but we will continue to rise to the occasion as far as Bangladesh is concerned, and I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to raise our women in labor force to 50-50. And the target of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, she has set a target for Bangladesh Parliament. For the Parliament, right now it's 23.7% 23 to raise it to 50-50 by 2030. So let's hope that you know, we achieve that. In conclusion, I would like to say that, uh, you know, um, women have the power within themselves. You know, they just, they're not aware of it. Shirin Abadi, who's the, um, you know, Nobel laureate from Iran, a human rights activist, she quoted that, you know, women are victims of oppressive patriarchal culture, but they're also the carriers of those culture. So let us not forget that every oppressive man who oppresses a woman or discriminates a woman was raised in the confines of his mother's home. And, um, uh, you know, the power within is, comes out when there is oppression, just like the women of 1971. They defied the society and they keep living on. Many of them are dying now because they've passed 47 years, but they have lived on and I salute them because, you know, think of it, you were raped, you were actually castigated by the society, but you lived in that society and you let, lived successfully. Um, you know, as Eleanor Roosevelt has said, that you only, you know, a woman is like a tea bag. Uh, she, you, you know, it gets, you can feel the strength when you put it in the hot water. So I'll quote a very, that's a very, you know, elite woman, but I'm going to quit, uh, quote a very ordinary woman whose name is Oralia Rauno Lima, who's amongst the first women in her indigenous community in Guatemala in all female entrepreneurship project in B, as a beekeeper. And she said that when I'm stung, I'm reminded of how strong I already am. Because she does get stung by a bee every day. And um, I would finish with Malala Yousafzai. She said there are two powers in this world, the pen, the power of the pen, and the power of the sword. And then there's a third power, the power which is stronger than both these powers, which is the power of women. So I think that you know, if we want to bring change, make change, we have to be the power ourselves. And, you know, just like uh, Dr. Jane Tiller, it's time to wear that badge that says behave badly or behave disruptively, otherwise you can't change the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, for that talk. Please take a seat. Um, I just have a few questions before we start the um, audience question and answer session. So you mentioned that Bangladesh is one of the world leaders in terms of female empowerment. What do you think could be done to improve upon what we already have in Bangladesh? I think that, you know, the very strength of Bangladesh is a secular society and an inclusive society. And we can just keep on strengthening our secular you know, a character and maintain that um, and continue to educate our women, which we are already achieving. So quality education for women, but in particular, the, um, you know, the World Economic Forum's next theme is going to be reskilling uh, women and minorities for STEM education and for you know, um, digital literacy. So I think while we have a digital Bangladesh, uh, you know, manifesto. It's extremely w important for uh, giving more digital literacy to our women because the world, you know, there are 600,000 jobs 
every year that the world's going to lose now because women don't have digital literacy. So I think very quickly we need to move there and give girls more digital literacy. And of course, like I said, you know, um, we have to um, continue to protect them from domestic violence. I think that's one area that we are always looking at, you know, to prevent more rape or harassment and sexual harassment and domestic violence by intimate partners. We have migrant workers, we have to protect them. The women migrant workers, you know, garment workers, domestic aid, we have to well, it's not entirely in our hands, but we have to try our best to protect them. So protection is very important. And at the same time, education. You know, in Bangladesh, education is free for girls up to class 12. Our prime minister wants to make it free up to undergrad. So I hope that, you know, we'll be able to achieve that. So there is no excuse for anyone's parents to say we can't afford to send our girl to school or college for higher education. Okay, okay. You're, you're an inspirational woman yourself, but... Who would you say are the women that are the most inspirational to you? Oh, globally? Yeah, just in general. I mean, there are so many women and so many names, you know. I, I always wanted to be a, f you know, a pilot. So Emily, um, what's her name? The first, uh, you know? Amelia. Amelia? Amelia? Earhart. Earhart. Yeah, I wish she's a great inspiration. I think everyone who's a change breaker, A, and women who have actually been on the combat, you know, shown physical courage and mental courage and that kind of courage always inspires me. You know, have you heard of Preeti Lada Waddedar? No, I haven't. Okay, so, you know, if it, I mean, I know there are so many global examples, but I think because I'm a Bengali woman, I would probably name three Bengali women who, to me, should be the greatest inspiration. Number one is Begum Rokia Sakat Hussain, who was the first woman to break that social stereotype. She broke the glass ceiling. She went out from house to house, collected students, and started the first girls' education scheme in, in, in Bengal. And not only in Bangladesh, but entire India. So she's definitely a huge inspiration. You know, you need to have courage to do that. Um, then the other one is Prithilata Waddedar from, you know, she's, she's an A student. She stood first in her what you call now GCSE, back in 1920s. And in 1931, you know, in 30s, in 20s, she graduated from uh, Chittagong University. And she was the first British, anti-British revolutionary from Bengal, a woman, or perhaps from entire India, she was the first woman. So in 1931, they actually bombed a British armory, and she died there. So huge inspiration. And... Um, I would say, you know, that um, our Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina is a huge inspiration. Um, I mean, if you look at global leaders, uh, she has been uh, a Prime Minister of a Muslim-majority country for more than a decade now. And this term, you know, our growth rate is 8.1 percent. It's the highest in Asia right now. We have surpassed China and India. Uh, growth rates. And, uh, you know, like I said, it's not just, it's beyond growth. It's not just growth. So, you know, she, it's inclusiveness, it's women empowerment indices in every way. I think she's breaking all records and setting such unprecedented leadership. So that kind of leadership definitely should be an inspiration not only for me, but for many other women. Okay. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, after doing a bit of research, um, I noticed that one of the main issues facing Bangladesh is um, prenatal and maternal health care. So, um, after looking at a few figures, I saw um, around 140 women die uh, per 100,000 births, and this is um, compared to the UK's nine. Um, so, what do you think could be done to, um, to solve this problem? It's very unfortunate that, you know, still mothers die while giving birth, something that should not be at this age. But, you know, this is, you know, there was a lot of lack of awareness about it in the 90s. So when the MDGs were set in 2000, uh, you know, things started surfacing that well, this is a huge challenge. So it was part of the MDGs. And you know, the MDGs target was by 2015, you have to bring it under 140. That is the target. So um, I think by 2015, so in, 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 the, in the, let's say around 2003, Bangladesh's, or late 90s, Bangladesh's per capita, you know, but the thousand births, the maternal uh, mortality rate was 660. So I think over a period of, I don't know, about 15 years, we've been able to bring it down to 143, which is a great achievement, I think. But of course, it's not good enough. We have to continue to try to bring it to zero. And uh, our target, currently the Prime Minister has set a target. You see, the problem was skilled midwives. So now we have 
we're increasing skilled midwives. And often, you know, in the rural areas, women have birth without a skilled midwife. So in, there are now 13,000 to 18,000 community clinics. And right now, maternal, you know, in, in terms of sexual and reproductive health, Bangladesh is, again, has been praised globally. I mean, British um, parliamentary, you know, uh, House of Lords, all-party parliamentary group on population and development, Banner Strong, she just led a delegation to Bangladesh. And I asked her, before that we were having lunch, I asked her, why are you going there? She said, Bangladesh is just so done wonderfully on sexual and reproductive health, because this entire, uh, you know, prenatal and postnatal checks up are completely free for all mother. 20 million women give, are given free services. I think that will, if that continues, it'll, it'll definitely improve those numbers. Okay. Um, now, I'm sure the crowd probably want to hear about, about yourself. Um, now, coming from an engineering background <laughs> myself, um, I did a bit of research into you, and I noticed you're from, also from an engineering background. How did you get into the diplomat Are scene? you studying engineering too? Yeah, I do engineering too. But uh, yeah, I'm just wondering how, how do you get into diplomacy? I think eventually you'll end up as a journalist or something, maybe Mehdi Hassan, oh, yeah. who knows. So, you know, there are no limits and boundaries, and that's how it should be. Of course, I worked as an engineer, but you know, um, what happens in Bangladesh, I, I don't know if it, it's, it's entire South Asia, I think, this phenomenon, or Asia, this phenomenon is that everyone has to learn maths and science. All that, you know, if you're a good student, you have to ace your maths and science and eventually end up either being a doctor or an engineer. And that's the, that's the concept and my parents pushed me towards it. But my natural tendencies are toward liberal arts. So I think I went around and came back to international relations. Yeah, oh, okay. that, that must have been that. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Um, now you mentioned something about the um, Rohingya crisis. Um, and that hasn't been in the UK media a lot recently. I was wondering if you could update us all uh, a bit about the situation that's going on right now in Bangladesh with the Rohingya crisis. Well, you know, the Rohingya crisis, the Rohingyas are rejected by their own country. Uh, they have been persecuted, they have been raped, you know, women, just like what happened to Bangladesh in 1971 had happened to the Rohingya women. They have been sexually enslaved, they have been tortured, they have been raped, their babies, their husbands have been cut off right in front of their eyes. And this is not what I'm saying. If you go to Rohingya camps and interview them, they'll tell you. So it's a, it's a historic recount of what happened. They're still alive and they'll tell you. So, you know, there are large numbers of uh, rape babies that were born in Bangladesh after, from the women who entered Bangladesh in the fear of life in 2017. And um, this is, um, you know, definitely uh, there are, uh, I don't know if you've heard about uh, the Gambia has filed a, um, a case against Myanmar for genocide and the International Court of Justice. And at the same time, the International Criminal Court, uh, they have a pretrial chamber. And if they feel that there's an element and evidence of, as you know, that the UN Security Council and UN and the three institutions had done independent, stu independent inquiries into the persecutions or the alleged genocide or crimes against humanity that were uh, you know, allegedly committed on them, including the UN fact-finding mission, which was led by British permanent representative to the UN, Ambassador Karen Pierce, and then uh, the independent fact-finding mission, which is an Australian lawyer who's heading that. He, he had a lecture at um, UCL the other day. And the UN High Commissioner's Special Representative, Special Rapporteur on Myanmar. So from all three reports, the International Criminal Court has taken some evidence. They found it liable that, you know, there are evidence and they are invest they have taken this Myanmar genocide case just for inquiry at the pretrial chamber. So right now, um, we feel from Bangladesh that, you know, some justice, a ray of hope of justice should be there for the Rohingyas. What is important is that you can't allow any country to get away with, you know, crimes against humanity or genocide. Not in 21st century. That should not happen. You know, if there was a conflict going on, like in Syria or other places, you could say, okay, things happened contextually, there was a conflict. But this was systematic. And, um, you know, in that case, uh, we want the Rohingyas to go back to their homes. They're a huge burden for Bangladesh in terms of you know, population burden, in terms of environmental, but most importantly, they're a great threat to human security. So not only to Bangladesh, but to the entire region. So, you know, the entire regional security is at stake because here you have more than one million people who uh, cannot go back. So they're like floating population. And for Bangladesh, 
tremendous pressure. Um, you know, it's 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 also um, tremendous. Um, what shall I say? I mean, international community is there, but what we need is the Rohingyas to go back to their homes in full dignity with rights and definitely some legal identity, whatever the Myanmar government decides. We tried with the Myanmar government to repatriate them, two attempts, but it didn't work out because the Rohingyas do not want to go back until they're given three things at least. One is they want their homes back, which were burned down. That's what they say. And number two is that they want a legal identity. And number three, they want their security and access to health, education, employment. They didn't have any of those. Okay. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, I'd like to open up the questions to the floor now. If, if anyone else has, um, has questions, um, please put your hand up, um, and I'll just pick you from the crowd. Um, yeah, go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for your inspirational speech. I just want to ask you, how do you balance motherhood and hmm. your career as a high commissioner? A very tough question. <laughs> the toughest. It's a very difficult job. It's a struggle. It's like a war. I feel that I'm in a war zone. I'm, I'm the commander and I'm always, you know, there's a battle going on and I have to win this battle. So it's like that. Because, you know, um, being a mother and a working mother and balancing between home and um, work is one thing. But when you are a diplomat, you have to live in one country and you have to move from one country to another and then your family is all over the place and so are your feelings, so is your little, you know, household, it's all over the place, so it's extremely challenging. But you know, somehow so far I have survived, but right now my children have grown up, but uh, still, you know, a mother is always a mother and I would rather have my whole family with me, so it's very difficult. But then, you know, if you have the support of your family, like your husband, and if your children understand that, you know, you're in a job which is challenging, it requires you to be in another country, uh, I, my family is extremely supportive from that. But I think everyone misses out. There's no doubt about that. Uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you for coming here for the wonderful talk. Um, my question is more down the sort of economic relationship of Bangladesh and sort of Britain. Um, it's very difficult to have a conversation these days without Brexit looming over our head. So in a post-Brexit world, British foreign and trade officials seem to be traveling all around the world for better trade deals with other sort of countries. And Bangladesh has a massive amount of export of ready-made garments and fresh goods to the UK. And there is a massive shortage of works for force in NHS and right. care service and in some other sectors as well. So has there been any initiative from the Bangladeshi officials to actually take advantage of the situation to actually enter into a negotiation with Britain just to see that if they can somehow fill up these places because uh, a lot of women from Bangladesh they now actually venture to the Middle Eastern countries and they actually work under very hostile environments often you hear news stories and these women might be actually able to fulfill these positions here and work much sort of in a much better condition. Sure. So your first question was what kind of bilateral trade deal we'll have with UK in a post-Brexit situation and the second is what are the opportunities, how we want to um, send skilled workforce uh, in a post-Brexit situation, particularly those sectors which is like NHS and nurses and paramedics. So first one is, you know, um, Yes, Britain is our third largest bilateral trading partner and we have about uh, you know, 4.8 billion US dollars worth of bilateral trade, which is 90% is exports from Bangladesh and 10% from the UK. But um, you know, right now we are still an LDC that has just entered the graduation process. And the process will continue until 2027. So until 2027, our position is we ask Britain to continue the duty-free, quota-free market access that Bangladesh has, had it been in the EU. So continue with that, even if there's Brexit. Uh, it's regardless of that fact, the terms of trade would continue to be that, and they have assured us, uh, con you know, considering our economic um, you know, status and our vulnerabilities and limitations, because you know, we just have one product, 
and we are diversifying. We still haven't. We have pharmaceuticals as the other product. So my target is to diversify bilateral trade and our exports to the UK and uh, find more trade for UK as well. So, uh, you know, our bilateral trade should not be only 5 billion US dollars. It should go up to 67 billions by 2024 if we do market surveys and find out what are the other areas where we can export to. UK, so um, we hope that UK will continue to provide the GSP facility that it provides with us, whether Brexit or no Brexit, um, depending on our status of whether we have we will be graduating from the LDC group, uh, fulfilling all these criteria in another nine years' time. time. And um, in terms of skills, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, your NHS does need um, nurses and paramedics, uh, perhaps even doctors, I don't know. But, um, uh, you know, right now the prime sector for which the curry industry keeps on lamenting is that they need more you know, in Bangladesh, the Bangladeshi British community here, their uh, number one uh, trade is the curry trade, the curry industry, the hospitality sector, and they lack skilled, uh, you know, they, they need chefs and shoe chefs, and they are not being able to bring them. They were given a promise before Brexit happened that after Brexit they will be allowed under this skilled uh, system, ba you know, the ba skill based system. However, you know, the wages are very high that they have set and they can't run their restaurants like that. So that is one area that from the High Commission I keep on focusing on, keep on lobbying with the British politicians and policy makers. Uh, but when it comes to nurses, you're absolutely right that we should be. Uh, as you know, we are having 10 million migrant workers and these are not immigrants. These are temporary migrant workers who go on a contract. And uh, we have 6 million in the Gulf and uh, we have 1.5, 1.7 in uh, Malaysia, then Singapore, another 100, uh, you know, 1 million. So we have about 10 million in ASEAN, Asia. And the latest is we are sending senior caregiver, you know, senior citizen caregivers to Japan. So I think uh, if we are all in the right track, you know, our skills, particularly women are going to Japan as senior ca caregivers and also to perhaps Thailand. Uh, so definitely they should be coming to the UK. However, uh, you know, we need to have a mutual recognition of degrees. So if I'm bringing, if I want to bring my nurse to your country, then my nurses, you know, the, the nursing institute degree must be recognized by UK's, you know, I don't know whatever institution is there. So that's important, that hasn't happened. So mutual recognition of degrees is very important for nurses to come here. and. Uh, it's very difficult to work with the UK government right now. I've been here for one year, but for one year, there's just no time for anything else except Brexit. So really, we couldn't have a policy dialogue because right now, you're waiting uh, general elections. But definitely, we explore it. Uh, but you know, the way it's happening with Japan and South Korea and Singapore is they train their people. So they send trainers, and they prepare people to come and work here. And then they recognize the institution and the degree and accredit it. And then they bring the people uh, on short-term contracts, such as two years. And they always get renewed because Bangladeshi workers are very low-abiding and very hard-working. Um, we'll take someone from the side. Uh, can Bangladesh retain whatever uh, trading rights it has with the, the EU? Sorry, can everyone hear me? Okay. Can Bangladesh retain? trading rights, existing rights in the EU, even after it has, let's say, a special deal or one of these new free trading rights in the UK? Um, I mean, Bangladesh's uh, GSP facility is actually with the EU. So if UK comes out of EU, it, we still retain it with the EU. It doesn't affect our relationship with the EU. And uh, it also would not be affecting our trading relationship in trade of terms of trade with the UK because we've already negotiated, we've already discussed it. Uh, whether we'll sign an FTA with the UK, not likely because it'll be a very uh, imbalanced FTA because uh, you know we only have one product to export to the UK. So we've discussed it with the UK foreign. I've discussed it with the UK foreign secretary. Well former Foreign Secretary. Right now, we don't know who's going to come back, but uh, definitely from both parties, across the party, cross party, we have discussed that, you know, they're sympathetic to the fact that we are still in LDC and they will continue the GSP facility. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll get for the 
Hi, I'm, I'm currently doing a dissertation on Bangladesh and the question of the dissertation is uh, <coughs> why, um, why is there so much electoral violence in Bangladesh and uh, why is it increasing uh, with every election period and is there a role of religion in that? So just yeah, ask the question. It, Sorry, like, why the is there question? so much violence? Electoral violence in Bangladesh compared to other electoral violence. Yeah. You're referring to the last elections. Yeah. So when violence in the last election was the least, you could say 2013 was yeah. the you know there was violence post-election and before, but in 2018 the violence instance was the lowest in all elections. So it was a uh, of course, in South Asia, in some elections, there are always an element of violence. But uh, I think last election, it was the least violence. 2008 was the least violence. The election in 2013 was the one that um, witnessed violence. And as you aware that, you know, there's a fundamental issue going on in Bangladesh. Um, I just spoke on the 1971 war. And in 1971, when the Pakistan occupied forces was in Bangladesh and committing crimes against humanity and genocide in Bangladesh, their, their immediate collaborators were Bangladeshis. I already mentioned it is an unresolved issue. There was no closure to this issue. So there are thousands of families. Millions of people died out of genocide, three million people. More than 300,000 women were raped and violated and sexually enslaved, and they wanted justice. So when uh, one Malik uh, you know, were campaigning for election in 2008. In their manifesto, they promised that when they come back, uh, since they were the party in power in 1971, they promised that they will organize war crimes tribunal. And they initiated the war crimes tribunal. And when the war crimes tribunal started, what did we see? We saw that the people who were the peace committee people, like chairman, president, they were all Jamaat e Islami in 1971. And they're still Jamaat e Islami in 2009. So it is just a sheer coincidence that you know, the people who had been indicted were the people all belong to Jamaat Islami. Now, the problem with Jamaat Islami is that you know, in 2008, the election commission um, had asked them to change their constitution in order to do, uh, take part in elections in Bangladesh, because the constitution is, is kind of contradictory with the constitution of Bangladesh. In Bangladesh constitution, you, no party which has a religion-based uh, constitution can take part in the elections. It has to be secular. And, um, you know, I think in two, by 2011, there's a verdict of the Supreme Court that, you know, unless, uh, you know, uh, that, you know, they change the constitution, they cannot take part in the 2013 elections. And that was the problem, you know, the, um, I think there were the clashes between them and uh, the other political parties. So definitely it's very unfortunate, but you know, um, if you know that there were many, many people, uh, you know, there were um, also the uh, other factions who were um, taking uh, apolitical, they were not doing politics. A lot of people died, innocent civilians were died, many, you know, buses were burned. So nothing unusual. You know, everything that goes on around the world. If you, if you put on CNN, you'll see this going on all over the world. But I think in Bangladesh, um, the 2018 elections, uh, violence incidents, if you check, it'll be much, much less uh, than 2013. But I think 2013 elections were profoundly influenced by those factors. Yeah. Uh, I'm really sorry, but we're going to have to end the session there. Um, on behalf of Bangladesh and everyone else here, I really want to thank you for coming and spending your time with us. Um, can you all join me in giving her a massive round of applause?